trigger warning, panic disorder. Take a look at this picture of me. It's a pretty good picture of me, right? Coats flapping in the wind. Got a big smile on my face. That is a good Graham aesthetic. Now I want to tell you the truth about that photo. That photo was taken about two weeks ago, right before I almost shit my own pants and canceled coming to this entire conference because of my panic and anxiety disorder. In this photo, I was driving up to the mountains for like a girls weekend. Woo! You guys know about girls weekend, right? It's just like drinking wine and Instagramming a lot and playing Settlers of Catan. Yes, I play Settlers of Catan, okay? You can add me on Catan Universe if you want. My username is Kelsey Dara. And as we're driving up in the car, and the vast mountains are coming into view, it hits me. Now, anyone with an anxiety disorder knows exactly what I'm talking about. It hits me right here. The anxiety poos. That rush of adrenaline that your body produces right before you have a panic attack or during, if you're lucky, you get both. And of course, the worst feeling about a panic attack is that it feels like it just comes out of nowhere. It just kind of hits you like an unannounced train running over you and you're just sitting there in the other carriage kind of waiting, scared for your life for that whole thing to pass by. And when it does, you dust yourself off. You take a deep breath. And you get back up on that train platform, anxiously waiting for the rest of forever, hoping that you will see that next train coming. So I'm in the car with a group of girls when it hit me. My first immediate thought is what? Like, I can't tell them the truth. What would I say? Hey, uh, guys, I know this is kind of weird, but like, I feel like I can't breathe. All of a sudden, my heart's kind of racing. My hands are sweating. And also, my hands don't look like my hands. Like, I'm looking down, and I see them, my hands. And uh, is time infinite, or is it happening really fast? Do you mind if we just like pull over at the next gas station? No. So instead, I politely ask, hey, um, can we stop for a pee break? We pull over in a gas station in the middle of nowhere, and I sprint to a cold, dirty, dark, drippy bathroom, and just in the nick of time, I expel my entire body weight out of both ends. <laughs> I'm feeling that panic start to take over, and I get out my phone and I text my manager, cancel Toronto Jack Summit, I'm not going. My panic and anxiety is too bad. Of course, we were in the mountains, so I had no cell phone service, and that gave me more anxiety. So I find myself sitting there in this tiny claustrophobic bathroom, pants around my ankles, sweat dripping from my face. And in that moment, I feel like a fraud. Kind of like the same way I feel like a fraud coming here to speak to you all. How am I supposed to give like a motivating, inspiring speech about anxiety when I still struggle on the daily with my anxiety and panic? So cut back to the bathroom. I'm shaking my head and I'm thinking to myself, I cannot pretend anymore. I knew I wasn't going to be able to keep up this charade for the rest of the drive into the mountains. I sure as hell wasn't going to be able to keep it up for the rest of the weekend. I have to put on a little bit of a mask. And I need to be a little bit brave, and I need to tell my girls the truth. So with my tail between my legs, I go outside to the car, and I say to my friends, hey, I don't know how to say this really, but I'm having a panic attack, and I just feel really uncomfortable. I'm sitting there, waiting for the worst. And to my serious surprise, they all say, OK, yeah, how can we help? What do you need? Do you need an Advil, something to settle your stomach? Do, do you want us to drive quicker up to the mountains? Not one of them judged me. In fact, when I tried to apologize, one of my louder friends said, why would you apologize? You have to treat this like a flare-up. I don't know why I gave her that weird accent, but she doesn't have that accent. She was like, you got to treat this like a flare-up. If you had like menstrual cramps, would you be apologizing? Everyone has something. So while we were pulled over there on the side of the mountains at a literal shitty gas station, we all let out a little laugh about what just happened. And I took that picture. I put it on Instagram with a very real caption about what just had happened, because I wanted to remember that moment honestly. 
the moment I decided to be brave, remembering that my mental health is just health and that everyone has something. I'm sure there are some of you here today, or maybe you have a loved one that you know that can kind of relate to that feeling of shame that I'm speaking of, where it can be daunting to walk around feeling like, thinking like, or in my case, smelling like you don't have your shit under control. And as someone who has had hundreds of panic attacks, starting from when I was a little girl, I'm here to say every panic attack can feel just as scary as the first one did. Surprise! Here comes that train! Choo-choo, bitch! <laughs> My first panic attack happened when I was five, okay? I felt like all of a sudden I couldn't swallow, I couldn't breathe, so my parents rushed me to the ER, and as soon as that doctor injected that baby tranquilizer into me, everything went back to normal. My heart rate went down, my swallowing functions continued normally. They couldn't find a single thing physically wrong with me. So they sent me and my parents out the door with no diagnosis and no action plan. Ah, the American healthcare system. You Canadians over here are like, I can't relate, we don't understand. <laughs> the panic attack that actually caused me to finally see a therapist wasn't till 10 years later when, drum roll please, I smoked marijuana for the first time at a girl's slumber party. Ah, yes. Every American girl's passage of right. After a couple of hits, sitting in a semicircle on my friend's patio at 10 p.m. on a school night, what happened to me can only be medically described as freak the absolute fuck out. <laughs> All of a sudden, I couldn't breathe, I was crying. All of those feelings that I described had happened to me again. And I run inside, and there standing in the kitchen was my friend's mother, where I proceeded to scream in her face, help me, I am dying. Now, my friend's mother happened to be a nurse, and she quickly realized what was actually happening when the trail of marijuana smoke followed me in, and all of my stone friends are sitting outside like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> so she sent my friends off to bed. She took me into the kitchen. She made me a giant frozen pizza, and she sat up all night with me talking and doing breathing exercises and explaining to me that I probably had what was called a panic attack. Ah, there's a name to it, I remember thinking. I also remember that she never once judged me. The next day when I went home, I told my very cool and liberal parents about it, and they put me in therapy, which I now realize was a huge privilege back then. And over the next 10 years or so, all the way into my 20s, thus began my journey with medication, psychiatry, and treatment. I tried outpatient treatment, inpatient treatment for depression, mood disorder, misdiagnosed bipolar. I was doing acupuncture, crystal healing, yoga, any experimental treatment you can imagine. And in the middle of all of this, I got my dream job at BuzzFeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So most of you who do know me probably know me from the internet. I work with BuzzFeed, usually making like weird cheese fondue combination videos or sketches about girls whose entire identities revolve around loving wine. That's me. I'm one of those girls. <laughs> but when I started to gain some success and some notoriety and even followers, I wasn't able to enjoy any of it. I was so stressed from work, I was overloaded with anxiety, I put pressure on myself to perform physically and data-wise that it didn't even feel like it was happening to me. It felt like it was happening to someone else. Because every day after work, I would go home and I'd be by myself having these derealization and disassociative panic attacks. I kind of felt like that YouTube kid, David After Dentist, where he's like, is this real life? Is this going to be this way forever? I felt like I was playing a character every day that I went to work. And I was living with this like weird fuzz on me that I couldn't shake off. One of my biggest fears was having a panic attack in public. Like, what if one happened right now? Wouldn't that be ironic? But what if it happened to me when I was on set? Or while I was running production? Would I lose my job? Would people invite me back? 
would anyone want to take a chance on working with me again? I mean, I'm, I'm in the entertainment industry, right? I, I'm a comedian and a producer. I need to be on camera. I have to be in front of people. I need to be scheduled to take really big meetings. I get to meet fans. I want to talk to strangers. I need to constantly convince people to like me. But I felt like I had this weird secret that my life on Instagram and YouTube didn't reflect what was often happening in my head and body. And I wasn't intentionally hiding this anxiety and, and panic. Like my close friends knew and my parents knew and I didn't feel like I owed anyone an explanation, right? So when I made my first video at BuzzFeed about my mental health journey during Mental Health Week in America, I didn't even put myself in it. It was just my voice. I didn't plan on speaking about it once it was published because I figured like no one's gonna know it was me and plus it was a little selfish that I made it anyways because it just felt like therapy for me as an artist or whatever artists say. But of course, 15 seconds after the video was published, the top comment was, oh my God, Kelsey Dara is so brave, I had no idea. Shit. I had no idea that a video that I made about my anxiety struggle, my terrifying misdiagnoses, my swinging relationship with medication went viral. And like, I know that's our job at BuzzFeed is like make things go viral, but I had never had such a personal story reach hundreds of millions of people. I was flooded with DMs and tweets, and two people even got tattoos of my story quoted on their bodies. And it suddenly had opened this door that I had never had before. Community. Strangers were now sharing their stories to me, saying that I had helped them by sharing my story when they didn't know them sharing their story really was actually helping me. I had so much support, and once again, no one was judging me. I got to read how truly millions of people all have something. So after creating this viral video, I became an accidental advocate. Right, like being an accidental advocate won't give someone with anxiety more anxiety, right? I mean, like, am I gonna say the right thing? Am I gonna comment back the right thing? Like people are asking me for advice and I was just like, I don't know, dudes, I'm in fucking therapy still. I'm trying to figure this out myself. I don't know what to tell you. When I realized that was the right answer that I was continuing to work on myself, that all of those years of therapies and treatments wasn't for nothing. I was unintentionally building my own tool belt, a tool belt of different practices that I could pull out at any time when the anxiety and panic got too bad. Activism made me realize that I could talk about it all I want. I mean, community is so important. But it also made me realize that if I wasn't doing the work here, I wouldn't feel the relief here or here. <laughs> my answer still to this day when people ask me, they DM me all the time, how do you do it? How did you get your dream job? How do you get your confidence? How did you get a super hot boyfriend? And no, I didn't just throw in that last one myself. <laughs> my answer is always the same. I'm managing. I had unhealthy ways of managing, don't get me wrong. I drank a lot. I mean, you can YouTube any of those videos of me drinking. I saved my feelings only for therapy, and I told myself that I didn't deserve to feel sad. I mean, my life online looked great. And the truth is, there isn't a quick fix. There isn't a cure-all. There isn't one right way to do it for everyone. It's about finding the healthiest ways that work for you. And to find those things takes work, I'm not gonna lie. Meditation recently became like super westernized in the last decade and really trendy in LA. And so many people would tell me, well, that's what you're missing in your life. If you just did that, you would be cured. And seriously, it would piss me off so bad every time someone recommended mindfulness meditation to me, I would look them dead in the eyes and say, meditating gives me anxiety. But of course, Therapist after therapist after psychiatrist after psychologist recommended it to me and I was like, fine, there's got to be a reason everyone's trying it. Because with panic disorder, it's all about control, 
or lack of control, that fear of unknown, looking too far into the future with fear or too far back into the past with worry. And mindfulness meditation can help bring you back to the present. And now I'm not saying you should be mindful all the time. God, no. We have way too many like notifications smacking us in the face of time. That would be exhausting. There are other ways to meditate. For example, for me, that means going to the movies on a Sunday morning by myself. I recommend it. Other times, it's going to a meditation class with like a bunch of hippies in a sweaty den. I don't recommend that. It really stinks. <laughs> but breathing exercises, checking in with my body, checking in with my reality, checking in with my intrusive thoughts, asking myself, is this fact or is this a negative feeling? These are the things I used to manage because I'm not one of those people that wakes up with sunshine coming out on my ass. I'm not. And it makes me mad that I'm not, which is even more ironic. I know that I have to do the mindfulness. I know I have to meditate, do the breathing exercises. I have to push myself to get out of my comfort zone every day, or else I'll be sitting on that train platform for the rest of my life, anxiously waiting for that next train to zoom by when I least expect it. But when that train does come, because it inevitably will for probably the rest of my life, I have to remind myself to speak to myself compassionately. Kelsey, this has happened before. This too shall pass. You've had these a hundred times. You didn't die on the last one. Your throat didn't close. Your heart didn't explode. Your universe didn't flip upside down. You didn't wake up in the Truman Show, which is an actual thought that I have often. <laughs> and more importantly, that this probably will happen again. I realized that that kind of self-talk would help me get through one panic attack, which would help me get through the next panic attack, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And the pain that I was feeling today would be my strength tomorrow. I didn't make that up, I don't think I did. I'm sure that was like something a therapist told me once. <laughs> so to close, the theme of this year's Jack Summit is revolution now! Revolution even gives me anxiety, doesn't it? It's like such a it's like a forceful word. It's like, oh, a tear gas and signs all of a sudden. I'm just like, no thanks. <laughs> but in Latin, the actual definition means to turn around. So a revolution to turn things around. Well, I know I can't turn my anxiety around. I have fucking tried. <laughs> but perhaps I can help turn around other people's perceptions of it. So I recently made a list uh, that was titled 15 realistic things you can help do to help someone through a panic attack. I had just scribbled this down in a notebook and I was actually giving it to my boyfriend who had no idea how to deal with me when those trains came. And then I posted it to Twitter because it actually helped him really help me. And bippity boppity boop bitch, the internet did its thing and that thing went viral again. People told me that they were keeping screenshots of it as their phone back saver, or they would send it to a loved one or a family member when they were starting to feel panic. Again, I got to see how millions of people did not feel judged and that everyone has something. I learned how to be observational with that fear and worry. I didn't need to love it. I didn't even need to like it. But most importantly, I didn't need to control it. I simply needed to sit beside it. I needed to invite it on that train with me and share a seat. Notice that it was there and ride to wherever the hell we were going that day. Because like I always say, I'd rather be on that train shitting my pants on the way to an adventure than be at home with my anxiety, not shitting my pants at all. Thank you guys. Thank <laughs> you.